Good day and welcome back to the 40 OT podcast with your host, Mr. Tom Sandler, of course, talking about everything, autism, mental health, neurodiversity, all of that lovely stuff. Today, we're going to be talking about autism in women. And I've wanted to talk about this for a long time because it's such a it's such a hot topic. Like a lot of the research and stuff is mainly done around men. And so there's a little bit of a stereotypical bias when it comes to uh, diagnosis in the medical educational arenas. And so I think it's really good to chat about exactly what the different experiences may be, um, perhaps from men um, in comparison to women. So today I have my very lovely guest, Taylor, who comes from the YouTube channel Mum on the Spectrum or Mom on the Spectrum. I always forget that. <laughs> and um, Taylor has, you know, been doing very, very well on you over on YouTube. I think reaching about just over 30,000 subscribers, which mm-hmm. is a massive accomplishment. And um, thank you. Taylor, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. I'm, I've been looking forward to having this time with you for a while. So I appreciate you bringing me on. Well, thank you very much. And um, yeah, I think what I just want to talk about quickly is, I guess, uh, a little bit about sort of the history or the background behind uh, you starting up your YouTube channel, you doing your, your work online. Um, could you give us like the lowdown on, on uh, or the summary? Yeah, the lowdown. Like? Yeah, absolutely. I so I'm 33, almost 34, and I first suspected that I was on the spectrum when I was 31. And for me, I knew like once once I once I had a better understanding of what autism actually is and got over my own bias, I was like I felt it in my soul. I was like this is who I am. <laughs> and you know, I had received other labels like ADHD Um, you know, you're just stressed. You have a lot of anxiety. That's what I heard my whole life. And those labels were helpful, but I I still felt like I was searching. And whenever I found the label of autism, it was like coming home. Like, I feel like I could stop searching and everything just kind of clicked into place. Almost just like putting a, a camera lens on and you hear that click and then you can just see. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So when I discovered that for myself, I didn't feel like I personally needed a medical diagnosis to support Mm -hmm. my own validation. But the way that I am in my life, I typically, the way that I work through things, because I've, you know, I've been, I've actually been through a lot, like a lot of health things, a lot of relational issues. And the way that I work through things is I, you know, um, when I was younger, someone told me, if you can't talk about it, it owns you. And so I've really taken that to heart. And I always try to talk about what I'm going through and it always empowers me and it connects me to other people. You know, I I realize I'm not, yeah, I realize I'm not alone whenever I share my story. And so when I knew this, you know, in my soul, okay, I'm autistic. I kind of, it's, I laugh now because I know myself and I know, okay, Taylor, like, I know you're going to share this with everyone that you know, (laughs) because that's just how I process things. And so I sought out the professional diagnosis because I knew, I know my tendencies and I know, you know, I'm going to share this publicly and I wanted to have that backing so that I just didn't want to lead anybody astray or I wanted to set a good example and make sure that Mm -hmm. I had, you know, all my ducks in a row. So with that said, I got, I got my professional diagnosis, um, when I was 31 and then I just, you know, it's like for so many other people I've talked to, it's this light bulb that goes on and you feel like your whole life starts making sense. And I just, I wanted to explore it and I wanted to invite other people to explore it with me. So I, I made my first video kind of secretly. Like I just, I snuck into a room and like, had, you know, horrible equipment. And I just started, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, Hi guys. Welcome. (laughs) Welcome to our YouTube channel. Um, there's like 20 cuts just for that sentence. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I had absolutely no idea. And, you know, looking back now it's, you know, kind of cringe, but it's part of my journey. You know, I look back and like, okay, that's where I started. So, um, 
yeah, along the way, it just, it started gaining steam. And actually part of what kind of shot it up is the video that I did over autism and women that really was Mm -hmm. um, very appealing to a lot of people. Cause I think it's, you know, what a lot of people are wanting to learn about and explore right now. So that's why I started it. So I was super excited. It's just the diagnosis process for, for women is just appalling. (laughs) It's very difficult. It's yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of adjectives, but it's appalling. Yeah. Sorry, I cut you off there. Were you were you going to say anything else, or uh, I don't think so. I um I really like about uh, what you said about if you don't talk about it, it owns you. Mm-hmm. And you know, for me, I think you know the greatest sort of progression in my life and the greatest sort of self growth that I've done has always come through you know, first talking about it, Mm -hmm. you know, for me, you know, talking about it on, on the internet, it doesn't really seem as, um, as much of a big deal as perhaps other people in my life would, would think of it. Cause they're like, Oh, you're putting yourself out there. You know, you're telling all these people you struggle with this, that, and that, and you're good at this. And you think this about this situation. And I think I, I understand I understand that view, but I also think that it's it's really important to have a dialogue about things, especially when mm-hmm. there's a stigma around it, mm-hmm. especially when there's a stereotype around it. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, get going a bit off 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 that train of thought. Um, mm-hmm. What I really love about your channel is that you know, for for a long time we've had pretty much like. You could say more, but pretty much three groups within like the autism sphere. You have like autistic adults in the community, you have parents of autistic people, and you have the medical system, like the mm-hmm. diagnosticians and the therapists and stuff. And I've I've always been of the sort of the motivation to try and pull these these different spheres together so mm-hmm. that it's it's more cohesive. Right. And so, you know, coming across your your channel and sort of having a look at the kind of content that you make and, you know, just going by by your name as well. I mean, it's it's great to bring those those parenting and autistic adult worlds together. Cause I feel like, you know, the the autistic adults of today, you know, they may have kids and become an autism parent themselves and also mm-hmm. be, you know, autistic. And yeah. I think it's really valuable to kind of both talking about parenting as as a as as a parent of an autistic person, but also your experience of parenting as an autistic person. So mm-hmm. I, I really love that kind of stuff that you do, and it's um, I really 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 admire it. Oh, thank you. I'm, I feel honored to do it. I mean, there's a lot of days when I just honestly I'm kind of brought to tears because it's. Like I found my community. I just, these are my people and I, I love what I do. So I appreciate you saying that. Well, it, it doesn't happen like as often as people think, like with, with the following and stuff, because I, I get a lot of messages like, well, not a lot, actually. Like now and again, I get messages from people who listen to the podcast and they're like, hey, I'm sorry. I know you probably get loads of emails, but I just want to say you're great and I love the stuff. And I'm like, this is this is great. I love this. Like yeah. it's really actually very motivating to hear hear that from people. Yeah, it is. Because a lot of people just get in touch when something's wrong or something's mm-hmm. negative. Um, that's yeah. kind of the ignition for it. But yeah, I mean, I guess how how did you start your YouTube channel and what kind of like what what was in your mind when you wanted to share it and what kind of sort of changes did you make along along the journey of getting getting to the the place that you are now good question so i knew when i started it i i got my diagnosis and i finally felt like you know nothing is wrong with me mm-hmm. i had a name to help me understand my experiences and not to say that i don't have plenty of unique challenges you know that that bother me every day. Um, but I really wanted to share the message that you're okay. I really wanted other people to know 
that you don't have to keep trying to fit yourself into a box and do things that are really uncomfortable. You know, you're okay as you are. And so I've tried to keep that message consistent throughout all my work. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, when I originally started, I, I didn't even, I just knew I wanted to talk about it. And so my original name when I started was the atypical Aspie. And that was kind of a mouthful. Like I, it just didn't sit well. So I kept that for a while, ended up changing it. Um, I, I have found throughout the process that people have given me a lot of, of feedback. So I think that the ADHD side of me kind of likes the quick cuts and like, you know, just the quick edits and transitions, but that is, that's really upsetting to a lot of people in the autistic community. They don't like the the quick cuts. They'd rather just have the long, you know, continuous shot. So I've started making my, my videos more long continuous without like the jumpy cuts. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's something I'll do in like fun videos because I still like the energy that brings. But yeah, I think I just, I take feedback from the community. So I'll, I'll ask people what they want to learn about. And then I essentially just kind of take that as an opportunity to learn more about it. Um, And then I also just, I model it off of what I'm learning in my own life. So whenever I learned about the term autistic inertia, for example, I just went crazy with that. and (laughs) I just had a field day learning about it and then wanted to make a video about it. So I think, and just from a technical standpoint, putting less sounds and distraction in the video. I mean, the autistic community just in general seems to like a pretty straightforward, like no bells and whistles kind of presentation, which actually makes things a lot easier um, so I've, I feel like I'm cut, I'm kind of dialing into a more calm tone throughout, if that yeah, makes sense. Yeah, That's a big, yeah. a big change that I've made. That's really interesting. I, um, I, I, I've been told that I, I either get two reactions to, to the podcasts and the videos that I make. It's either, oh, you're so boring or, <laughs> or your voice is really relaxing. Yeah, I I think the latter. Whenever I hear your voice, I'm like, oh, I'm I'm in a calm space right now. (laughs) Well, um, I guess it would be quite apt. So I had a little bit of a speech apraxic moment there. Mm -hmm. I guess we should jump into the first question of our topic. You know, everyone, we're talking about autism in women. And um, of course, this is going to be extremely, extremely generalized, um, just as with talking about any concept to do with autism, mm-hmm. everyone's different. Everyone has their own experiences. Not everybody fits into, you know, a particular label of being a woman. But I'm sure that whether whatever you identify with, you will find some use in this. So... I guess the first thing that I want to ask you, Taylor, is Mm -hmm. what is your experience of secondary school? Like what, what is the experience like for, for an autistic woman? Yeah. And I, I had this conversation with Thomas earlier. It's like, I don't call it secondary school. So my brain is always like, whoa. High school. So yeah. High school (laughs) and, and middle school. I love, I love that difference though. So I, you know, looking back on it, I just always felt on, like I had to be on and I was like vibrating, like with this electric energy of kind Mm. of not feeling settled. And I am an overachiever and I found that if I could follow the rules and not make any waves, if I could make good grades, I would stay under the radar. Um, and, and making good grades, honestly, I mean, I say it was easy for me. I put a lot of work in, but it was easy because I knew how to do it. Like the teachers give you a formula, do this, study this. Now it was hard for me to learn from my teachers if it was only like a lecture, because I have Mm. to have words in front of me. I have to have something in front of me in in order to understand what I'm learning. So I would mainly like learn things on my own. And that was hard because basically I'd be sitting in class just waiting until like they gave us the assignment. I'm like, okay, I, I don't hear anything that you're saying. I'm not internalizing <laughs> any of this lesson. Like, just tell me the page number. Ta- Taylor, I, I I have the exact same experience. That's, <laughs> it's actually quite bizarre. I um, 
was definitely a overachieving myself. I didn't get in trouble hardly any ever. It was only at like the start of probably probably you could say about middle school um, when I when I tended to get in trouble. That's because I was talking so much. Mm-hmm. But like in secondary school, like I, I just became like a completely different person. I lost like all of my charisma energy personality whatever you could say became very sort of dissociated and detached and i really love your exact your description of like that sort of buzzing electricity anxiety Mm -hmm. because that is like i uh, i've I've tried to explain that to, to a lot of therapists that i've worked with or to my family or to to loved ones or friends and it I always describe it as sort of having like ants crawling on your bones, like mm-hmm. kind of this, this uncomfortable internal feeling of just painful mm-hmm. electric, but it's only like mild in the background or like all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like, you know, definitely it's like the whole secondary high school experience. <laughs> <laughs> It was it was pretty much just complete dissociation from start start of the day till the end of the day, and I I really can't recall a lot of the in depth sort of details and the positives and stuff because you know a lot of the stuff that was going on around me, whether it was to do with bullying or whether to do with sensory overwhelm or just generally feeling a bit paranoid because I didn't understand what was going on in mm-hmm. the social world. I found it really hard and I, I, looking back on it, you know, I feel like I was pretty heavily dissociated for the majority of high school. Yeah. And so two things, I'm going to say it so I don't forget it. So the dissociation and the bullying. So with dissociation, I, you know, I know during this time we're, we're all figuring out who we are, but yeah. for me, I was whoever was in front of me. And that's, yeah. that's, that's how I first came to study autism because one of my colleagues mentioned the term copy and paste behavior. Mm-hmm. And I just instantly knew what that was. I had never heard that before, but, but I was like, okay, so you're telling me that other people don't constantly watch what other people are doing and like try to mirror what they're doing in the social. <laughs> and then she's like, no, that's not, that's not a normal thing. So yeah, I feel like I just I took on the personality of whoever whoever was in front of me. Like if they were bubbly and social, I could I could emulate that. If they were quiet and reserved, I would emulate that. Um, and so, along with the dissociation, I just and this is with the sensory burnout too. My brain's hopping a bit all over the place, but like being with the fluorescent lights and like the talking, and then mm. after class, going straight out into the hallway where it's people everywhere touching you and oh loud god, yeah, you recreated it too much, Taylor. I, please, okay, sorry. Trigger warning. I'm trigger joking. Warning. I'm joking. I'm joking. Go on. <laughs> trigger warning. Busy hallways. Yeah, <laughs> but all of that, like constantly being on, constantly copying and pasting. Uh, Mm. yeah, dissociation for sure. And also I was so depressed and anxious for a lot of my Mm. high school years. You know, I'd have, I think I had a family member reach out to my parents and they're like, is Taylor okay? You know, cause I just on the outside, you know, I was, I was the leader of our national honor society. I was the drum major in our band. I created an, an after school group that I ran. Like I was at everything all the time. And, And from the outside, I looked okay, but inside I was I was really struggling do you find that like a lot of the sort of the extracurricular stuff and like the sort of the the work that you did during school was kind of like um trying to put some some form of like certainty on the environment because any any time that I was outside during break or lunch time I almost indefinitely just get get that in- incredible feeling of anxiety and sort of you know the hyper awareness that you get when you're a teenager is just amplified mm-hmm. so much. And if I felt okay if I actually had work to do, so I mm-hmm. would usually like try and do my homework in the lunch times in the library. Yeah, just because it was like something else that's certain that I could focus on that's not like in this crazy environment. 
Yeah. And I, and I think that's too, like with the leadership positions, I could be among the people, but I didn't yeah. have, you know, I had a specific set of instructions and I was responsible for leading and taking charge. And I, I knew my role there. I was fine in front of a group of people. You know, I do, there's some social anxiety there, but I'm actually pretty comfortable, you know, on a stage in front of people. And, and so I enjoyed leading things because I could still be around the people without needing as much of a script mm. to do so. And there's a bit, there's a bit more of that sort of, the social norms are different in like a presenting leading environment, like a workplace environment when you, when you compare it to outside, which for teenagers is just absolute mess. <laughs> yes, absolute mess. Yes. And then what I was going to say about bullying is I, you know, I remember one instance in middle school and I guess I was, I don't know, probably 10 or 11. And I, I, I had been invited to a sleepover that I later felt like I was invited to just because, um, almost for like, I don't know, spectacle feels like the wrong word, but I've definitely felt like I wasn't one of the girls. Mm. And when I went, like, it was really important to me. I really liked these girls a lot. I thought that they, you know, I wanted to be in this friend group. And when we were there, they would like, I remember them all being in a different room and just kind of laughing and looking at me. Like I always felt like I wasn't part of it. And I remember them like an object rather than like another person. And they would say, okay, well let's play, you know, truth or dare. And they would give me a dare in the other room. And it would be something, you know, I remember at the time it was humiliating. They're like, go shave your legs, you know? And I, I, it was just weird. You know, it's like they, they gave me things to do and then they would like stand around and like laugh. And so it's hard to know, you know, because in my head I'm like, well, it's kids and they're being silly, but I just always kind of felt like this outsider that they didn't know what to do with. And so I, I think I remember my mom coming to pick me up early from that. Cause I just, I was like, I don't think that I really belong here. I don't know what's mm-hmm. happening, but it doesn't feel right. Yeah. I, I really appreciate you being open about that. Cause it's, although, although it's far in the past, it's still, you know, it's, it's, it's quite an early part of, you know, your, your development as a, as a human being, it's it's almost well. It is a critical part of many people's lives, and having having a negative time and a difficult time with people, especially like around teenagehood, it can really like screw up a lot of people for life. And mm-hmm. there's not a lot of, you know, some people they'll sort of deviate, they'll find autism, they'll kind of process it all, um, and all that. But there's a lot of people who just continue to to sort of live their life, and they have this very combative sort of defensive way of approaching relationships and friendships and Mm -hmm. it's kind of it's kind of like copying like how people were to you when you were when you were younger yeah and I definitely I definitely was like that and um it was only until like uh when I was 18 19 because I was diagnosed when I was 10 years old but I only really understood it as more than social difficulties and sensory difficulties when I sort of got involved with the autistic community. It's kind of it's kind of like a new a new diagnosis for me. <laughs> it's it, I I did not know a lot about it at all, and a lot of the therapy that I had was specifically around uh, depression and anxiety. Mm-hmm. I think. You know, that when you when you were talking about that sort of situation of being like a spectacle, mm-hmm. I can think of a lot of situations in my life where I, I, I empathize with you on that. Like there was a situation perhaps when I when I was a bit younger. Cause I, I, I was, you know, a teenage boy. I, I was a pretty much obsessed with just school, um, taekwondo and girls. And that was my, that, that, that was, that was my um, <laughs> interest in sessions. Yes, indeed. And the issue was that is that it led me down a lot of routes to be made a spectacle of. So like, you know, I would think that someone is interested in me. They give me like the signs They say, oh, come hang out with me. But all the time I know because there's always a friend there and that, you know, they're always sort of giggling and talking and, you know, that kind of feeling where you just feel 
a little bit like an object or like a source of fun or difference in their life. Mm-hmm. I felt that very, very heavily. Like I, re- I really empathize with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's an uncomfortable feeling. It's like a fish out of water kind of feeling where you just start to question like, well, what, what is it about me? You know, why, why, why do they look at me that way? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's obviously it. I I think obviously my, my social skills are a lot better now when I understand sort of the ways that I'm different a lot better than I did back then. But it, it, it did pretty much happen in every, every way possible. And I never really masked that much or not, not as much as I can remember. Most of my masking was just being quiet and observing. Mm-hmm. I didn't really interact with people like that. I didn't really copy them, but it did start to happen when I got to university because I, I understood a lot more about social world. I had those, those negative experiences. And so I kind of put like researched all of like the positive traits that I need to embody. And I just embodied them. And it was, it was extremely toxic for me. Cause I was just putting on a front, I'm putting on a mask. But at school I was, I was pretty much just me just very very quiet me very introverted yeah. me and yeah, i i i was a, a big target for emotional social bullying not a very big mm. target for physical bullying because of my mm. my size but yeah well, that's a, that's a good distinction to bring up definitely i don't i don't think we talk about that enough the emotional mm. social bullying yeah i mean i've, I've had instances i definitely have there was this one situation where I was uh, in line for a class and one of the other popular kids was kind of picking on someone else and I sort of intervened and said, you know, why are you doing this? Um, and so they punched me in the balls and they, they they hollered over their friend group to come over and say, oh my God, look at Tom, he's not reacting to me hitting him in the balls. And so they all sort of gathered around me and punched me in the balls. That was That was the most physically like physical bullying that I experienced. Yeah, that's terrible. I think the the best way that I can describe sort of the like the the whole secondary school situation and its relationship to like trauma or, or bullying would be mm-hmm. it was very diffuse. It was very just yeah spaced out quite a lot. And it mm-hmm. was pretty much every situation from getting on the bus to getting into school classroom classes. I loved them. I was great at them. I did the same as you. I, I researched <laughs> beforehand and didn't really listen and then sort of got the assignment. <laughs> yeah. But for the other times, break, lunchtime, any sort of transition period, that was like full on anxiety mode. And I yeah. wanted to be interacting with people. And I wanted mm-hmm. to have like a relationship. I wanted to have friends. And so I put myself in that situation pretty much all the time. Yeah. And it wasn't always the best. Definitely not. But d- diffuse is definitely the, the best way yeah. of describing it. It's not like yeah, a think, significant event or anything. I think for me too, it's like, it's bringing up that phrase, you know, death by a thousand cuts. It's like each individual thing, if you look at it, you're like, oh, that's not too big of a deal. Like Mm. I can, I can manage that. But then all of a sudden, you know, you've got 10,000 paper cuts and you're like, what is happening? So (laughs) I think, I think diffuse is a a good word for it. It just kind of, yeah, it's, it's hard to just point your finger and be like this, but Mm. it's just this, this conglomerate just kind of, you know, all of everything all at once, all the time. (laughs) Especially we are a vulnerable group in terms of social stuff and being manipulated yeah. And emotionally and socially abused, it's quite easy to do it to a, a very young autistic person. So it's like, mm-hmm. you know, there's, I, th- I think the best way of describing it is like, I don't want to make comparisons to be like um, taking away from the diagnosis, but I know that, you know, for example, with PTSD, there is a specific event that happens. And you get stress from that event and it 
cause you to get, to get PTSD is that one traumatic event that's categorized. Whereas something like CPTSD, complex PTSD, that's kind of the more um, like diffuse thing, mm-hmm. you know, because we're, we're so sensitive as well to sort of other people and emotions because we we just are always kind of in limbo about mm-hmm. what's going to happen next or did that some that that person say something in a different way and am I not interpreting that it's like it's like someone's cut off like part of your senses and you just can't yeah. like make sense of what's going on yeah and I don't know if you've found this but you know when I get to work with the autistic community every day it's like I I feel that we're, you know, generally speaking, very empathetic. And Mm. somebody's even described it as like being an antenna when you walk in a room, you just like, you know, what other people are thinking and feeling. And I think a lot of that is because, you know, the copy and paste, like trying to figure out what everybody is thinking, what everybody needs, and what I'm supposed to do in the situation. And so naturally kind of makes us in tune with what other people want and need. And I think that's one of the reasons that we're a target, uh, you know, intentional or unintentional, because Mm -hmm. people see us to be empathetic and able to, you know, relate to what they're going through. And so um, I think a lot of times that's taken advantage of, because unfortunately there's not, (laughs) there's not enough empathy to go around sometimes. Yeah. And it is a time of time in in everyone's life where, you know, we're, we're, they're not adults, you know, they, they have a lot of growing to do, um, as well as yourself. It's kind of, I think, I think just that, that, that fact and sort of like, you know, cause we, we, t- we tend to be sometimes characterized as like little professors when we're younger, yeah. cause we like, we like to talk to adults because they speak directly. Mm-hmm. Whereas when we go around the kids, they're always like, they take advantage of our directness and they kind of take different routes to sort of communicate with the people around them yeah i remember there's one situation at school where i was in a group and you know one of the individuals was um known for using like their own language between themselves uh between them and another person and um i had a, cr- a close friend who you know, I, I, I think now and did think then was a good friend. And they told me about this while, while, while they were doing it and they were talking about me and they had a word for me. And I was just like, oh my God, this is absolutely, I think that's a good, a good way of describing how it feels to be autistic in school. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone's in on the joke and you yeah. just have no idea and you're just trying to navigate it and not sink. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that. But then there's also the aspect of puberty. You know, I I, I can talk about my experiences. I didn't really have many issues related to puberty other than the emotions. Mm -hmm, That's what I was going to say. Typical adolescent brain, uh, perhaps a bit of itchiness and acne. (laughs) Um, But I guess I I would really like to to know what sort of your, your experience of that was. Yeah, I'm, I mean, definitely emotions that that's hard. Uh, you know, alexithymia is something that we really struggle mm, with on the spectrum and like the, in, the inability to name what you're feeling. And, you know, as as an adolescent girl, it's hard when your your hormones are changing and you don't really have any words to to communicate what those emotions mm. are. Like, you you know that you're not OK, but you don't know how to communicate that. So I think for me, that led to a lot more shutdowns and, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to put the name selective mutism on it, but I think that helps some people understand. It's like these instances where you just, you just are unable to communicate. Hmm. Yeah. And I I can see that looking back on how I did that, you know, with my family and the people that I felt safe around. But, you know, a big one for me was just feeling like I didn't have control over my body. Hmm. You know, and this, this is a, a, point right now where I'm terrified as a mom of an autistic girl who who needs to have this conversation soon. Yeah. <laughs> like she is going to flip out when she finds out what is going to happen with her body. And I was thinking about this as I was kind of thinking through our conversation today. And I'm I'm wondering if this, you know, I've been studying more demand avoidance. And I feel mm. like this could relate because it's like your body is demanding that you change. 
and there's nothing that you can do about it. And it's yeah. just, it feels crippling and like you're almost like a prisoner in your own body because, you know, the sensory element, you know, I don't know how much we want to get into it, but the sensory element for a girl of, of having a monthly cycle. I mean, it's like, yeah. I mean, it's the worst thing for somebody who has these sensory aversions. Like it's like so, pads, so hard. Pads and tampons and stuff. Yeah. It's so hard. And then, and then, that in a social context of, you know, like needing to ask for one at school. It's like, it just is, is com- it's compounded like everywhere. So yeah. it's, it's for sure so hard. And, you know, it's hard when you feel like you can't reach out to the people around you to talk about it because you don't know how. Mm. So definitely a very challenging time. And I am, like I said, I am really like sweating it over here because my daughter needs to have the conversation soon. And you know, this just a little funny tidbit. She told me the other day, Mom, I really do not ever want to be pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Okay. I said, That's fine. Totally. That's your decision. And she goes, But how? And I said, Well, you just, you know, you can decide that you don't want to have a kid. And she goes, That doesn't make sense. I said, Well, you and your partner, y'all decide together, like if you want to have a kid or not. She goes, Mom, that does not make any sense. <laughs> so I think you know, she's going to keep pushing on that. And I'm, I'm working yes. on, I'm working on how to You've talk already, to her about She's it. already laid the groundwork. She's going to pursue until she yes. gets the answers. Yes. She's got that single focus where she's not <laughs> going to forget about this for sure. <laughs> I, um, I think definitely that cause my, my, um, friend Vicky from actually Aspling, she does, um, or she, she is researching for, for a doctorate in psychology She's done some, she's done a, a presentation at the autism show in Manchester on autism and puberty in girls. And that was, that was quite eye opening because like, you know, obviously I don't have those experiences. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, you know, uh, it, but it, it was really, it was really good to kind of hear the sort of the other side of it. Cause I think, I think with, with men, it's it's not as other than sort of the acne and the voice change and the the facial hair and the body hair and stuff and of of course the emotions i don't i don't think that we have it as as hard in terms of like the sensory aspects um definitely around around the monthly cycle and stuff yeah, because that's never ending, right? It's like that that follows us follows us everywhere. It's the but, start, and then it just continues until it stops. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just crazy. So we've talked a little bit about sort of the experience at secondary school. Like, it's it's very traumatic for a lot of autistic people. It's mm-hmm. you know. No matter, no matter what your gender or sexual uh, sexual orientation or what your sexuality is, mm-hmm. it's always going to be very difficult. And um, I think it would be good to talk a little bit about like the social norms. Like if we were to sort sort of talk in a broad sense, um, not necessarily about secondary school, but it can be related. Mm-hmm. What social norms around women make it hard? Well, for me specifically, so I'm in Fort Worth, Texas. I'm a, I'm a Texan, and I'm from the South. And are you actually? I am, and oh we are we are expected to be a really good host and just open our home to everybody. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, where I'm from, you know, it's like everyone goes to church and everyone's inviting yeah. everybody over, and you know, you should just keep your front door unlocked and everybody's invited over. You know, that's how I grew up, like. And I'm really grateful for that. Like my parents were parents to many, many people. Mm-hmm. And I've always appreciated that about them. But, you know, that's kind of the model that's set here is, you know, be the hostess with the mostess and and cater things and have people over. And, and that, you know, that's really, really hard, especially as a mom, because now you know, my kids are wanting to have their friends over Mm. and, and I want to support them and I want this to be a safe place for their friends. But the, the energy cost of that is quite intense. And it's something that I have to plan well in advance for and recover from afterwards. 
So those types of expectations are really hard. I don't think it's the same for men. You know, men aren't expected to like cook a meal for everyone and, you know, be a safe place for everyone to come over, you know, after school or whatever. And, you know, I don't want to speak for men, but I'm just trying to think of the differences. Um, gossiping is also a really big one. Like, I feel yeah. like women just like to gossip and small talk. You know, can you believe what she was wearing? Why did she say that? And that kind of stuff for me, it's kind of like what you were saying about ants crawling on your bones. I'm like, well, I can't, this isn't a conversation for me. You know, so you I just don't like it. It makes you feel uncomfortable. No. You don't want to have the small talk. You don't want to have all this gossip about. It's very like I, f- I find you know just it's it's very people focused people and events focused when when I'm talking to neurotypical people whereas mm-hmm. like with autistic people it's almost like we just jump straight into the meat of the topic and we're just talking yes. about uh, a fact or a concept or a theory or you know our thoughts or our feelings on on those things that's interesting, like it being around, about a, a person or event. I saw this funny, maybe we can link to it, but I saw this funny reel. I wish I remember the name of it, but it was this autistic person saying a, a neurotypical hack is like, just to mention what day it is at your workplace. She was like, neurotypical people just love talking about what day it is. So you can just walk up and say, it's Wednesday. And they'll like have this whole conversation with you about, yeah, two more days to the weekend. Like they just like talking about I don't know, <laughs> events, you know, like. That's so I just, true. I know. You say like, it's Monday. Oh yeah, it's Monday. And then they start talking to you. I just thought it was such a, a clever little hack and it, it plays into what you're yeah. saying about, you know, there's, there's like specifics that they want to talk about, but not the meat of it. Because if someone, someone came up to me and said, it's Wednesday, I'd be like, yeah. It's Wednesday. It's Wednesday. <laughs> Period. <laughs> and just, just stare, stare at them blankly. Like, <laughs> yeah, just know? nod like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It is. Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah. Um. <laughs> oh, I thought that was pretty good. Yeah. I um I do have experiences with the gossiping thing because I mean it's it's something that not a lot of people know about me. Sorry, I was just looking up that person. But it's okay. I totally did, I did not mean to like I just wanted to give credit to the author but now I've like have hijacked our conversation. Oh it's it's fine remember I've got the the old editing. Okay mouse. it's Kaylin underscore VP and I can give you the spelling. I, I know that I recognize that oh, I was gonna say. Sorry. It's okay it's fine. Yeah I, I do have experience with the gossiping side of things like the majority of my friends when I was younger were women. Like, I didn't really have any male friends. I kind of had a male group that I went to to, like, play football or do some weird parkour stuff. <laughs> and that, that was that was quite nice, but I never really felt like I really fit in with, with those groups. And so I always sort of gravitated around, around women because I, I felt like um, the communication style... That, that dudes have was a lot more harsh or a lot more sort of direct. And I was always looking for that kind of emotionally in tune person to be friends with. And it just, just so happened that the majority of them were, were women. Mm-hmm. But the, the gossiping is, is real. Like it's, it's, um, especially, especially like in secondary school, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really quite horrible. It's like, I, I know that there's been some research done about it where men are more likely to physically bully people, but women are more likely to emotionally, socially bully. Mm-hmm. And I never really got that emotional, <clears throat> emotional, social bullying from um, other dudes. It was pretty much women, uh, girls in my group, sort of gossiping, and you know, because I, I was I was a spectacle as as we talked about i was the, the weird one i they didn't really show weren't really sure how to characterize me mm-hmm. and i mean t- to be honest that that trend kind of continued for a long time and I, I find it really hard to connect with other men and i've been trying to work on it quite a lot mm-hmm. lately but um yeah they get the gossiping could you talk a little bit about 
a bit more about like kind of how it affected you or like did it have any yeah the gossiping to me you know one thing that i have also noticed generally speaking is really important to the autistic community is integrity and honesty mm. i think that's maybe one of like the greatest strengths of the autistic community and for me it felt like playing with fire like i did not want anybody to think that i was talking badly about them I didn't want anybody to think that they couldn't trust me with what they needed to mm. tell me. So for me being associated with the gossiping, it was like, this isn't who I am. This isn't, you know, it, it just, it made me feel like it took away from my ability to be a safe place. And I, I feel like that's one of the things that's most important to me is, is to be a safe place for other people. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, um, we talked a little bit about like the social norms. I guess sort of transitioning to in a to a topic that's you know related to autism and women, mm -hmm. not necessarily to do with secondary school. <laughs> 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 what kind of challenges <clears throat> do you or have you faced in maintaining relationships and friendships, whether it be something from your side or whether it be the other people around you? Yeah, this is something we've been talking a lot in the uh, a lot about in the community groups that I've been running lately, and it's it's really interesting to go back and explore. So I have I have a best friend that has stuck with me. Like we've been best friends for twenty years, and the the people in my life that I have relationships with, you know, I don't necessarily. I guess what I'm trying to say, I have a few close friends who have been there forever. Like, it's not like I'm over here making new friends and, sure. you know, I've been able to do that a little, a little bit through the channel, which has been really wonderful. But in terms of maintaining the relationships, I think honestly, kind of my saving grace with my best friend, her name's Wally. We only had two years together. So she was here in seventh and eighth grade. That was right before high school or secondary school. And then she had to move across the country. And ever since then, we have been long distance best friends. And I think that that's been really helpful for us because mm -hmm. I need a lot of space and I need a lot of time by myself. And I, I just, I feel like it's a really good, I, I need boundaries of knowing like, this is my space. This is my time. And I love her. I'd do anything for her. I'd drive across the country today to go see her if I could. So I think that that personal space is really important. I think communication, you know, obviously this is a, a big one, maintaining relationships. Communication is kind of what you were saying earlier. Like, I just want to jump in and talk about the meaning of life, you know, <laughs> um, something big. And, and sometimes that can be really off-putting of like, wow, like, did you know today's Wednesday? <laughs> I'm going to go back to <laughs> so that kind of thing. So, so I you think just jump straight into the, the core topic. like the... Yeah, like like when have you been most afraid? And you're like, no, not like that. But... <laughs> so I think the challenge there is that I, like when I do commit to someone, I'm very intentional and I will remember your birthday and I'll send you a card and I'll remember that appointment that you had that you were nervous about and I'll text you about it and and so I think it's just with me, it's like all or nothing. <laughs> and that can be kind of a, a tough balance to strike mm -hmm. with, with a lot of people. <laughs> sure. I think the, um, I really feel the communication aspect of it because I've had a lot of friends kind of in the, in the past sort of dropping off like out of my life, not, not necessarily like by anyone's decision, but. You know, especially when you, you're a creator and what you do for a living or partly what you do for a living is create content, is talk to people, is, you know, you create a post, you have comments, you reply to the comments, uh, you get messages, you, you have to sift through the messages, make sure you get all of them. And like managing that as well as managing friendships, <laughs> it's so difficult and... Mm -hmm. You know, what are you saying about having like a long distance friend? My my best friend, well, my really good friend, she 
we we have a long history and she she was she's always been like really 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 supportive of me and she was kind of like the one of the first people at university to kind of for me the first connection that i had like proper connection that i had in adulthood not not all of them of course but mm-hmm. it's a specific one because i i had a lot of depression a lot of anxiety and stuff and yeah. there, was, there was an instant where i tried to like you know, put a full stop at the end of my life, and mm. she was the one who who saved me and like mm. got me support. And she, she, I, I, I've always had a very, very, very close relationship. I think of her as a sister. She's like yeah. an amazing, amazing person. I hardly ever talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> hardly ever. Like maybe three or four times a year. Like even just on messages and messaging and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think it's it's hard sometimes, especially with communication, because it's not like you can put a stopper on it. And yeah. you know, if you were to start a conversation with somebody, they may they may think that you're wanting to have a conversation, but you might just be sending a message and then coming back and sending a message the next day or in a week or so you never really know with that stuff, and it always makes me feel very very anxious i'm like oh my god i haven't spoken to this person they're gonna think i'm dead they're gonna think i don't want them don't want to be friends with them anymore and some people are like that and some some people do just just drop off they're like i can't deal with this like you're not my friend if you we talk so yeah they don't say that but it just happens yeah it's kind of reminding oh sorry i don't want to cut you off please please go on uh i was just gonna say it's reminding me of uh, I guess that I could put it in like a text message perspective. It's like, I think a lot of times when people need something, they'll reach out and be like, Hey, how are you? How's it going? What, how are the kids doing? Yada, yada. And then they'll ask for what they need. But for <laughs> me, you know, for me, I'll just like, Hey, you know, can I borrow your, yeah, me too. Whatever. Like, I'll just come straight out. <laughs> and, and, and like, you know, I haven't talked to you in three months, but like, can I borrow this? like to me that's more kind it's like this is what i this is what my intention is you know i'm not like trying to deceive them into thinking that you just yeah i'm not trying to just catch up for the heck of it you know so it reminded me of what you said about putting a stop around things it's like i just kind of come out of the gate swinging and and you know with the with the other side of like how are you how's your day going i that's where i feel like there's no stop around things of like okay i i'm not signing up for this you know this isn't not, yeah. this isn't what i have the capacity for right now i i've managed to distill it down to uh hey how's it going good how's you going and then i get into the topic i've managed to yeah. distill it down to that so far so yeah there's I'm a little bit that. yeah I, I tend to do that too <laughs> Just that initial, like, hey, how are you, is typically all that's needed. Well, that's kind of, I suppose, it could could be seen as sort of speaking in terms of friendships, but what about, like, romantic relationships or um, any other class of partner-partner relationship? Yeah, so one thing that I come across with a lot is kind of, generally speaking, again, our inability to decode flirting. Uh, mm. I was I was running a class on this other day on dating and relationships. And somebody was saying that they had gone out for drinks with somebody, come back and their friends were like, how was the date? And she was like, that wasn't a date. And they're like, that was the date. So just knowing like she had been invited on a date, went on a date, didn't know that it was a date and came home and like all of her friends were like, you went on a date. So I think there's a lot of the decoding where unless it's like very specific, like I want to date you, I want to hold your hand, you know? So I definitely think it can be hard to receive flirting and understand it also to give, you know, to be flirtatious. Cause that, to me, that almost feels like a mask, you know, again, I just like to be kind of straightforward about what I'm thinking and feeling. Well, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Cause as mu- as much as we would like to avoid it, there is, you know, there is some kind of playing aspect of the whole. You know, are we gonna are we gonna go on a date? Whatever, are we attracted to each other? And it's kind of that 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 whole, especially at the start, that kind of strange dynamic where you both mm-hmm. know that you, yeah, you, you both understand what you each other is trying to do, and you, you're trying to work with that. 
especially with the flirting. Like I've had I've had people flirt with me before, and I know it's 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 hard to believe, but um, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> and it's I I pretty much always take it as a negative. Like if people are like poking me and like uh, picking at me, I'm like. I don't like that person. It's like I'm pushing to the side, and you know you have that whole rhetoric of oh, if you're you're younger and you're at school and a girl's like hating you and like picking at you, it means that they like them. It's kind of like that, but I just take it straight as a negative, and I just hmm. like, <laughs> that's interesting. Like the the whole sort of flirting dynamic, it's very very. Like, I don't like him, really, that much. Yeah, it's confusing. And I know that it's something that's needed, like, sometimes, especially if you're wanting to date a a neurotypical individual. It it, it can be quite hard, definitely. Like, Yeah. Because it's it's definitely an important part of of a relationship in the sense that you're you know, flirting is a way to express interest in each other. Mm. And, you know, I think along with that comes physical touch, which can be very challenging. You know, a lot of people on the spectrum are, our need for physical touch is going to be very different. So some people um, might need a whole lot of it and might need like really, you know, a firm kind of physical Mm. pressure. And then some of us don't want to be touched at all. Mm, kind and, of sensory then, defensive kind of yeah and then that might that might change every day so like maybe today you need lots of attention and affection and the next day you don't want any sure. so that can be very hard to navigate in a relationship because it you know most of the time again generally speaking for the autistic population like it's not personal you know it's not because i don't like you and you're making me mad it's like i just need some space. Just don't want to touch I, anyone. Like, I don't want anybody to touch me. And especially as a mom, when you have your kids climbing on you all day, every day. <laughs> the Aspie yeah. world is talking about that as well. It's I was like, listening to that one the other day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I obviously I, I, I was thinking it would be great to talk to you about, about parenting and stuff. Just, you know, yeah. in, you know, how you present yourself online. I think I think it's really interesting. I, I I I forgot something and then I've remembered it about sort of that whole flirting dynamic thing, mm-hmm. and it's it's very indirect. It's all in it's indirect communication, like mm-hmm. direct communication. Most of the time, for me, has not worked. Like going up and saying, "Hey, I like you. Uh, do you want to go on a date?" You know, like <laughs> like. <laughs> Uh, do you want to do this? Like actually having the, you know, doing the questions kind of detracts from the whole process that a lot of people go through when they find someone new. Um, and so they, they kind of think it's a bit weird. It's kind of a mm-hmm. bit desperate, even even though they may be feeling like that's something that they might, you're something that they might want to pursue. Yeah. It's, it still comes back to the fact that, you know, you're being direct with them. And that's kind of rushing things along in their brain. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's very sense. confusing. No, it does. Like, like you said, you, you can be direct about something and then the other person might want that too. But it's like the fact that you were direct about it kind of throws everything off, mm. which is, but I like what you said about flirting being indirect communication. And, and that makes a lot of sense why autistic people would struggle with that because we do prefer direct communication and we have a hard time reading between the lines. So that, that makes a lot of sense. I've done a lot of work on improving cognitive empathy, which is, do you, are you, are you aware of the adaptive cognitive em- empathy stuff? A bit. I've, I've done a little bit of research on it. Not enough to like explain it to you. <laughs> okay. So ad- adaptive empathy is showing the, it's pretty much what we think of empathy being. It's showing the correct response to someone's emotional state and there's another half to that there's the cognitive empathy part of it which is being able to notice based on indirect signals like Mm. bodily cues how they're speaking whether they're acting differently than usual and if i think that that's 
you know, over time I've, I've really been sort of trying to build up my cognitive empathy. So I can tell nowadays if people are, are, are like interested in me, I can't tell whether they want to be friends or whether they want a relationship, but I know that they want to interact with me. Um, but the actual, like, especially if I was thinking of myself as a, as a single man going out in the world, I, 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 and I didn't have access to any online apps or anything like that. I would mm-hmm. just walk around thinking nobody likes me, like, because I just literally, I just don't pick up on any of those like signals, those signs. Yeah. Um, so I, I almost in the past, you know, primarily use dating apps, which, you know, we, that could be a whole conversation that we could have about, <laughs> yeah. about that stuff. But <laughs> Yeah, that, that those early stages, those are those were really hard, but and, and can be quite difficult to ma- navigate, um, especially if you don't have a lot of um, experience. Like if you mm-hmm. haven't dated anyone before, if you haven't, um, if you don't have any a lot of practice with social interaction with neurotypical people, I'm talking all, of course, in the context of autistic neurotypical, but. Yeah. Now that can be a barrier, but what about, you know, during, you know, once the relationship has been somewhat characterized as you guys being together, what kind of issues do you think sort of come up as far as like maintaining that relationship? Um, Well, I think it's a lot of the same, actually. I mean, I think it's just continuous communication challenges. I mean, and that's, any relationship, like it's important to evolve your communication skills. Um, but particularly, Great. you know, one thing that I do talk about a lot is whenever you're in a neurodiverse relationship, we'll, we'll say one is neurodivergent, the other is not. It can be really helpful. Well, let's just say autistic. If an autistic person can, can uh, become more aware, and this is something we work on kind of in some workshops, become more aware of what your signs are when you are having a meltdown. Um, and that takes practice, that takes time. And then when you're not in meltdown mode, at a, in a safe space and a safe time, being able to communicate what that looks like to your partner so they know, like, that's a, a really major thing in neurodiverse relationships is autistic people feeling bad that they can't communicate what's happening when they're in meltdown or shutdown. So if you can learn to communicate about those things before or after they happen to kind of give your partner the understanding of, okay, this is what's happening. It's nothing personal. The things I can do to help are give space, bring them a snack, like take the kids for a while. Um, so I think you know, for a lot of autistic people, it's learning how to communicate about these things when you're not in a state of shutdown. And that has been really instrumental for a lot of, a lot of relationships that I've worked with recently. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's always a a difficult one because, you know, there's that whole concept of double empathy, you know, we can find it a little bit harder to understand and empathize with the neurotypical experience and, and, and likewise. And so there's always some level of understanding or awareness gap like mm-hmm. uh, around communication, especially when there's emotions involved, like in an argument or something, mm-hmm. um, you know, where, where all logic goes out the way and we're in some, some emotional state. I think uh, it's definitely like, it's definitely a hard thing to do because it requires you to really, really understand yourself, uh, but also understand yourself in relation to the neurotypical brain. What's different about them? How am Mm -hmm. I different from them in these areas? And then you've got to try and find ways to explain it so that they understand and right. they have to do the same. So like <laughs> the opposite way around. Yes. It's very convoluted. Yeah. And it, like you said, it involves a lot of self-awareness. And this to me is like a, a lifelong process because our, mm. our meltdowns and shutdowns are going to evolve and change over time. And so just continually checking in with yourself and having that self-awareness of what is going on. And like you said, how do I communicate this? And how is it different than what my partner is experiencing? It's a lot. Mm-hmm. It's very challenging. I found for anybody who is 
may, may be struggling and kind of sort of bridging that gap. I found writing really helpful, like having my own space to speak because mm-hmm. socializing inherently has some kind of like driving force behind it, like some kind of, right, we need to continue the conversation on. So sometimes it's really hard to to speak in a detailed, understandable way, like on the spot, like, Mm -hmm. especially if it's not something that we've, we've been thinking about for a lot, long time. And we don't have those views sort of, um, inherent to us. And I I really like your, your suggestion about communication because it is ultra important in every relationship to communicate. Mm -hmm. Not many people get it right. (laughs) A lot of people do. And then, and then adding the aspect of having two different brains together, it's like, whew, Jesus, you need to like properly understand the communication. Mm-hmm. You know, if someone feels that something's a bit off, that you have a conversation about that and you try and get to the bottom of it. It's not a fun process. It's not like a romantic kind of right. ideal kind of In, in the moment. In the moment, it's not romantic, but but yeah, I think then afterwards you feel the safety yeah. between the two of you, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's definitely worth that investment of time. Something interesting that might be helpful. So in the community group I was running recently on dating and relationships, there was a suggestion from one of the community members that I thought was just fantastic. So in relation to physical intimacy, um, we were talking about how difficult it can be to transition into that space. And so they use, they have a light, uh, like a special light and either, either partner can turn it on whenever physical touch is okay. Whenever that's something that they want. Um, and nobody has to respond. Like it's, it's, you know, take it or leave it kind of thing. So nobody has to talk about the fact that the light is on. Nobody has to respond if they don't want to, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's one way they're able to communicate. Like I am open to receiving physical touch and it, kind of cuts down on the need for communication and the, and it helps transition and like from one mental state into another one, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like the, um, like the red light, amber green light kind of system that you have for like autistic people in school, autistic people at events, they have like the system where it's like green, come up and talk to me, you know, Mm -hmm. amber, it's like, I prefer to to not talk, um, but if it's important, come talk to me. And then Red's mm-hmm. like, no, like get get away. I don't want to talk. I suppose you could do it. It doesn't necessarily have to be a light, does it? It could be like a reversible wristband or like a one of those. Yeah, it could be anything. Those, those octopus plushies where you turn them inside yes. out and once. <laughs> yeah. I have them wrapped. Um, I have them wrapped under the Christmas tree right now oh, for my kids. Oh, nice, nice. That was- the number one thing on my daughter's list, she wrote a billion reversible octopuses. Is what she wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I I love I love the autistic sense of humor. Like uh, I get stuff like my my mom's friends. Uh, you know, we're, I'm quite close with my mom's friends, and she has a daughter is who's autistic, and she comes out with the most beautiful statements because she's so hyperlexic. She has mm-hmm. all these this vocabulary to use, and she just presents it in a way that just like <laughs> it's so <laughs> adult, but she just says it as a, as a kid. So it's like, and she doesn't yeah. really comprehend it. And it's like, <laughs> That's great. It's brilliant. It, it was really like my, reminds me. My daughter will tell me about. So my daughter's nine. My son's six. And she'll talk about her younger brother. He's antagonizing me. <laughs> <laughs> No, he's being mean. Like it's just he's that antagonization. <laughs> yes, indeed. Mom, he's gaslighting me. <laughs> That's next. <laughs> he has no cog- cognitive empathy for me right now. <laughs> I mean, there's there's the stuff that we could that I could touch on quickly. So I made like a sort of a single post over on my Instagram. Thomas Henley UK, if anyone wants to follow. And um, I went through some of like the common barriers that that have come up for me and through talking to other autistic people. Mm-hmm. It was the, the direct versus indirect. 
I think that's a really big thing. Because, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's the whole thing of, you know, the neurotypical, they interpret it wrong and they're like, you know, you, what you said, you know, how you said that, it didn't really sit well with me. And, and we're like, my words, me and my words, they're like the, the same. Yeah. There's also those touch needs, as as you were saying. Like, I think for people who don't really understand autism and sensory stuff, like you saying to your partner that your partner's coming over to cuddle and you're like, no, 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 I don't want to cuddle now. And mm-hmm. uh, some people take that really badly. Some people yeah. are okay with it. Um, I think that is definitely another one. There's also alexithymia. Mm-hmm. Like, as we were talking about earlier, like, how are you supposed to, if your partner asks, well, how do you feel about it? Like, how, well, how are you feeling in our relationship? Or how do you feel? And it's like, oh my God, like, I'm going to have to spend like a week trying to figure out <laughs> how I feel about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just having, having the space, I think is really important. Mm-hmm. Obviously the cognitive empathy, you know, neurotypicals getting frustrated at us because we can't understand how they're feeling without them telling us mm-hmm. the hyper focus i think is yes. could be another one mm-hmm. you know, someone may try to start a conversation with you when you're engaged with your special interest or when you're no. working and <laughs> that's it's like, so hard it's not it's not gonna happen no, no, it's, no. it's like can we not do this now um <laughs> that's yeah, another definitely. thing that people find out that kind of inertia is hard for people to understand yeah and also the processing, especially during arguments, processing mm-hmm. time. Massive, yeah, massive. That's, that's one thing I was going to mention is the delayed processing for mm-hmm. sure. That makes it difficult because I can, um, we were also again saying in community groups, like a lot of times the the answer that you give is not the real answer. So like if somebody asks you a question, you give an answer. It's not necessarily how you let's say the question is, how are you feeling? You give an answer. It's not necessarily the real answer because the delayed processing of it, it's like, like you said, it's going to take time, like days, a Mm. week later, you'll be able to understanding from hindsight, start understanding, start internalizing what actually, what the impact of that conversation was, how it affected you. Like it just takes a lot of time and it can be really uncomfortable for the other person when you like come back to a conversation a week later and you're like, Hey, this is how I really feel about <laughs> yeah. it. And yes, they're like, why exactly. didn't you say that? And they're like, yeah. how are you hitting me with this now with no warning? It's like, yeah, yeah you asked me to think about it and I thought about it and here I am. And a week later, yeah. <laughs> so trying to yeah. explain it to you. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really, really critical because I, I I've, it's not currently out, but I'm sort of making a series that's kind of talking about autism in relation to like uh, manipulation or emotionally abusive tactics. Like there's a particular one which I have experience with and it's absolutely awful. It's called a uh, word salads. Yes. Have you heard of word salads? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Someone rattles off continu- like continuous points unrelated to each other. Mm-hmm. With the intention of just discombobulating you. Yeah, making you confused and forgetting what your point was in the first place. Exactly. And, and what we really need in an important conversation, especially when it's about the relationship, is even even less speed than usual and just time yes. to think and time to like process and talk to it talk to each other about it. But obviously it's not always like that. And mm-hmm. you know, some people may get frustrated and say like well, we need to talk about it now. It's important. I want to talk about it. I'm feeling this way. It's like, mm-hmm. it's probably not the best time to be talking if you're feeling like you can't sort of rein things in and just have a, have a conversation. Yeah. I don't, I, I think there's, there's stuff around that. That's, that's definitely pressing, processing time. Mm-hmm. Um, especially with, with people who are, are perhaps not the best for you can right. really sort of, mess you up because you you feel like you don't have anything to say that you're stupid and you're like yeah you're not you just don't have the time to explain things and answer questions 
Right. And when you're dealing with the word salad and other manipulative tactics, it just, it's like somebody spins you around in a chair and it's like, well, wait, exactly. you know, I, I had a point and it was important for our relationship, but now, you know, that it, it just kind of exponentially increases your processing time, I think is what, what you said. Yeah. Yeah. And you're always trying to like catch up with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, shut, shutdowns, meltdowns obviously can be another whole different ball of eggs, but I eat. Bowl of eggs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a whole different bowl of eggs. And, the other day, um, I was uh, shooting a video, and I said, "I was." I meant to say "can of worms," and I said "bag of worms," and I didn't catch it <laughs> until I was editing. I was like, "What? <laughs> bag of worms?" Oh man! Yeah, yeah. Um, my brain does that sometimes. I, I take <laughs> well-known phrases and I just change one word in it, and it just completely doesn't land. I'm just like, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> But yeah, the, sh- the shutdowns, obviously, I think are probably more problematic in a lot of senses because if you have the selective selective mutism, um, that can really be hard for, for people, especially if you're having an argument. Yeah. And then they push you further and then you have a meltdown. Um, it can it can really just get in the way of like productive conversation about like things that really need to be talked about within relationships. Yeah. yeah. And the risk of sort of pushing pushing things onwards. I mean, I know we're, to- we're sort of the the overarching topic of the podcast is talking about autism in women. And mm-hmm. in what ways do you think the experiences of relationships for autistic women may may be different? Hmm. Let me think about this one for a second. I think one thing for women is. The way, and this kind of plays back into our expectations, are just expected to look a certain way, you know, dress up for your partner and look cute and be flirty. You know, I think a lot of times for women, we're expected to be the flirty one or, um, you know, I think to just going to events and being like the supportive girlfriend or whatever, you know, the supportive mm-hmm. partner can be hard because it's a lot of social interaction. Um, so I think just the way we carry ourselves and, um, you know, this might, this might be less autism related, but I think in general today, it's just hard for many women to feel like they can be assertive, which I do feel like actually is really important to talk about with autistic people because it's so important for us to speak bluntly and directly. Hmm. And a lot of times that is not received well. Like people don't like it. A lot of people don't like it when women are assertive and they're unapologetic. And so I think that's especially hard for autistic people who want to live a life of integrity and honesty and be open about what they're thinking and feeling. I think a lot of times that can be met with like, well, you know, you're, you know, the B word is kind of how it Mm -hmm. comes across. So I think that bluntness and kind of clashes up against who we're expected to be in a relationship. And I think women are ready to be like, and we are, we're the strong, confident partner, you know, that wants to have equal say. And, you know, I'm getting on my soapbox now, but I think there's a lot at play there for sure. Thank you for that. (laughs) I think there's, there's also another aspect, which is perhaps a little bit more dark, which is sort of in the realms of like abuse and negativity, because the statistics Mm. that are out there, like just for abuse in general, in all, all domains are pretty horrifying. Yeah. Um, and if I think I think I did see a, a study where it was like happens happens a lot more that, to autistic women, mm-hmm. especially since you have you know men are a lot more likely to have a certain personality that can be abrasive and manipulative and abusive sometimes. Mm-hmm. I feel like considering that more more men are like that. I would, you know, I'd say that, you know, women are a lot more um, vulnerable to that kind of physical, yes. physical related abuse. Like, Yeah, and it is unfortunate. And again, you know, I'm thinking about these dating and relationship groups. I mean, the, the women who were open 
about the abuse that they faced was, you know, if I had to just give a number, I would say it was easily 60%. And these were just the women oh who were God. open about. Yeah. So unfortunately, you know, I, I feel like it, again, going back to what we said earlier, generally speaking, you know, autistic people are pretty empathetic, but even, but women even more so, you know? And so I think that we tend to attract people sometimes that, like you said, give us word salads and are manipulative and try to, to use our empathy to make them feel better. We kind of lose track of who we are and we want to make the other person feel better. So we'll give mm-hmm. our body, we'll give, you know, our emotions. And unfortunately, a lot of times there'll be an abusive situation where on the other side of it, the delayed processing, everything, you know, on the other side of it, it takes you a while to realize what even happened. Yeah. And unfortunately that, that is a common story among women on the spectrum. I remember, I remember the start when, when we, when we were chatting, you were talking about sort of the, the mirroring behavior with autistic Mm -hmm. women, like the mirroring, the masking. I I only recently realized that there's actually like three distinct types of autistic camouflage. There's like masking, assimilation and compensation. That sounds great. It's like like the the three domains of of camouflage. And it was something really interesting about mirroring because we actually have neurons in our brains that, that, that do this. And a lot of the time, when when you mirror something, it it's it's like a two way street. It's like you mirror something or present something on the outside, and that has an impact on internally how you are and how you feel. Mm-hmm. So, like we're we're very much like a lot of us can be like emotional sponges. Mm-hmm. In that case, like we we really take in on what people are feeling because we're mirroring what they're doing if they're acting angry we're we're going to be stern and angry or we're going to be blunt and straightforward if mm-hmm. they're nice and empath- empathetic we're like oh yeah it's like you know and I, I think that mirroring behavior it's it it can have it's it's a lot less it's 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 not really understood so much as an actual like biological neurological mechanism like it's re- it's a very very human thing like yeah we we actually use this this network for a lot of things and particularly like when we're making decisions um mm-hmm. which is wh- wh- when the whole introspection alexithymia stuff kind of gets a bit um interesting mm-hmm. we when we think about making decisions so we're in a supermarket we see one option and the other option and when we look at things and when we're going to buy something, we kind of model what it would feel like to eat it, you know, in our brains. And that actually produces physical feelings that are, that encourage us to go one way or the other. Mm-hmm. So I feel like, so the, the mirroring behavior, I think because, because men tend to do it a lot less. We also, we also tend to, to mask a lot less in general. I think I think it's 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 really important to kind of highlight that it is like a, a scientific like neurological thing that does happen and mm-hmm. it can actually have really big impacts on you especially if you're doing it on a constant basis it's like yeah you don't get to develop that self that sense mm-hmm. of self identity yeah it's always dictated by the people that you're talking to or people that you're around yeah well, no, I think it's it's a great point to mention, because, and that's that's kind of again going back to like my bottom line with my videos and the reason I do the groups and coaching. It's like that's my bottom line is that you you you're worthy of being able to express your true self, and there's there's so much that we do masking, mirroring, but and like you were talking about earlier, dissociation. It's like we've lost a lot of who we are in the process of trying to assimilate and trying to 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 be okay. Um, and to make it socially. And so I think a lot of the work that that is important to me now is doing the work of unmasking and and figuring out who's underneath and just giving that person a space to be safe and comfortable because we all, we all deserve it. And the the world will ultimately be a more beautiful place when each of us is embracing who we really are. It's like uh, my good friend, Brian Bird, quite prominent autistic speaker, late diagnosed. He said, 
Um, it's like having a new life or having been born again or, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's so much uh, incredible amount of growth that you can do once you know that you are autistic and you're like yeah. delve into it and you really um, understand yourself in it. And you can, it's not even just like a present and then future effects. It's like it can rewrite how you, how you look at and how you understood and internalize like things in your past, like mm -hmm. things that happen because you didn't understand a certain situation or, you know, there's, there's all of those things and it can, it can be absolutely life changing to, yeah. to, to go through that process and really, you know, it's amazing. It is. So it has been very, very lovely to talk to you, Taylor. And, um, I guess what I want to ask is, where can people find you? Well, um, you can find me on YouTube, youtube.com slash mom on the spectrum. And my main website is mom on the spectrum dot life. And, uh, you know, I've been talking about community groups a lot. I've got a lot more coming in 2023. I've uh, been working on creating these safe spaces for us to come together and talk about these topics. Um, we talk about dating and relationships, autistic inertia, um, demand avoidance, ADHD and autism. There's all these different topics. Uh, I teach on them and then we have group discussion. Um, so you can find out more information about that at momonthespectrum.life slash community. Brilliant. And I'm on Instagram and TikTok. Yes. I will um, stick all of that stuff down in the comments as per, not the comments, the description as per usual. <laughs> and if you have enjoyed listening to me and Taylor ramble about autism, uh, in women uh, make sure to go over and well, head over to my Instagram go DM me on there let me know that you've listened to this um, let me know your thoughts on it what I, what you liked what I could have done better anything like that always very open and if you are listening on a podcasting platform I would really really appreciate a rating or a review or anything like that, preferably the five-star variety, but obviously I have no control over that. <laughs> You're <laughs> worth the five stars. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. And yeah, make sure to head over to my Instagram. I have a link tree on my Instagram, which pretty much covers all of my links. But other than that, there's the website, thomashenley.co.uk. I am in the process of starting up my own business so i will be self-employed at some point and i will be reaching out or sort of putting adverts out around uh, doing one-to-one -one coaching as well as a bit of workplace um, sessions um, so if you want to stay up to date with that go over to my instagram that's pretty much the hub of all things and if you want to check out the rest of the videos that i've made or check out the video version of this podcast uh, you can head over to YouTube. I think that's everything. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for having me. I uh, I really appreciate the work you're doing. I I particularly appreciate the the breadth of topics that you cover. I mean, I just you know listening to some of your podcasts, I'm like, oh my gosh, nobody else is talking about these things. So I just thank you for the work that you're doing and for inviting me on the show. I feel really honored to be a part of what you're creating. You've been an absolutely amazing guest and. I have thoroughly enjoyed speaking to you and I'm sure um, everybody who's been listening to us will appreciate the, um, I was going to swear, I'm trying to think of a good, appreciate the, the, the ever-loving person that you are. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I you. think you could tell where I was trying to go with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you have a very lovely day. See you later, folks.